housing. Uh, and um, this is the my my talk will will focus on on a type of uh, housing which is about courtyard housing, with the idea uh, of looking at why. Uh, this typology, which has existed for more than 6,000 years across different geographies, cultures, and times, uh, is uh, uh, an acknowledged actually as a form of uh, uh, sustainable housing, does not really uh, get reintegrated in, into contemporary times. And I will use that to trigger a number of questions from the audience. Uh, to discuss about what can we learn from the history and what is heritage and how then um, this can inform uh, strategies for the future, for a sustainable future. I have the pleasure to have with me two of my PhD students. Uh, as you know, I work on heritage, I research heritage, uh, and I have been uh, researching uh, uh, heritage cities and world heritage cities um, across North Africa and the Middle East for the last 20 years with various HRC funded projects uh, focusing on courtyard housing, but also on public paths. And two of my PhD students are here in the panel. Uh, one is, uh, is Bayan El Fauri, and she will be also talking, and um, Abir. Uh, uh, Al-Qaid, who is also uh, uh, a new uh, PhD student, both of uh, whom are working on heritage-related uh, projects. Uh, and I also co-lead with uh, Professor Oriel um, Priceman, the Heritage and Conservation Research Group at the School of Architecture. So I wanted to uh, start by looking at um, courtyard housing. So I have put here uh, a kind of image, uh, uh, aerial photos of both the World Heritage Cities. When I say World Heritage Cities, is UNESCO World Heritage Cities um, that are of uh, in Morocco, which is Mar Marrakesh and Fez. Uh, and the idea here is to see that there is a very close relationship between the building form and the urban form in a way that when you look at this uh, urban fabric, you can see that all the buildings are really stuck to each other uh, and they share uh, at least uh, three, two or three walls. Uh, so they are kind of sheltering each other from the elements and from the outside temperature, but uh, in doing so they create a very dense urban fabric that is walkable. Uh, and I thought that I have been fascinated by this type of cities because I was born and I grew up in Algiers. And Algiers, of course, has a, a similar type of uh, cities which are based on courtyard housing. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the heritage fabric uh, and uh, of which also um, influenced in some way, but also inspired uh, movements like the uh, uh, like Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier has has really traveled quite a lot in Algeria, and he has been uh, inspired by um, the kind of cubic uh, houses around courtyards. Um, if we look at this, we are here in Aleppo. Of course, Aleppo is a, a city that has been inhabited by many, uh, many, uh, for many, many centuries from the uh, antiquity until today. And it's important to recognize that courtyards existed in antiquity from Hellenistic to Roman times, and uh, also um, in different civilization, different geographies. And what is interesting here is that uh, we can see the juxt, this is the souk of, uh, of Aleppo and the juxtaposition of different building types of different scales. So it's a mixed use uh, uh, development, which is very much promoted today as an important element for sustainable cities. Then if we um, uh, go to Marrakesh, we see here very, um, very narrow alleyways. And uh, if, if any of you have been to Marrakesh during the summer when the temperature can reach 45 degrees, you will, soon realize that in the European city, outdoor spaces are extremely uncomfortable, where, uh, whereas in the kind of uh, heritage uh, city, which is very dense, you have canyon effects of very narrow streets, and therefore 
you can easily walk even when the temperature is at 40 degrees, you are in the shade and have, of course, at lower temperatures. So there are quite a lot of um, uh, lessons that are embedded in uh, this type of heritage buildings uh, in terms of passive ways of uh, creating cities that are environmentally friendly, that are walkable, and that are uh, uh, that are um, multifunction have got mixed use and do not have necessarily a segregation, a spatial segregation between the poor and the the, the rich. And I will show uh, how this can happen. Here we are in Cairo with a beautiful courtyard, the kind of palace house. It's a large house. Uh, and um, if you look at uh, this, you soon realize uh, some of the elements that help to create microclimate and connection with nature within the domestic space. And uh, we have all experienced the need to connect with nature and to be with, uh, to have natural ventilation during the COVID pandemic. And of course, courtyards allow that to happen. So even if you are locked into your house, but if you don't have, if you have a courtyard, like when you have a garden, the courtyard is uh, is an outdoor space that reconnects you with with the sky and with with nature. Um, so the, here again, we are talking about uh, a courtyard house uh, during uh, the the Roman civilization with the peristyle uh, type of courtyard house, which allows shade and an internal garden. Uh, so you, you, the rooms are all inward looking with a, a circulation that protects from both uh, sun and rain. And then we learn from this type of historic buildings also in very interesting adaptations, which are based on locally produced craft elements like the mashrabiya, which is this wooden screen, which plays quite a number of uh, roles. So you can open it here for views and over, of, overlooking. It uh, filters uh, or reduces the glare uh, of the very harsh light uh, that exists in Cairo. We are in Cairo here. And it also allows for uh, ventilation, natural ventilation. So you have here daylight, access to natural daylight and natural ventilation. Talking about the uh, courtyard house, we are here in Fez again in Morocco. And this is a cluster of 10 uh, different courtyard houses. So the common element between all these uh, houses is that all buildings actually, is the they are all inward looking and therefore the, the courtyard frees the walls from the necess necessity, the external walls from the necessity to have access to light or bring daylight and natural ventilation since the building open from the inside, which allows of course, the houses to be very much juxtaposed and then uh, increase the density, uh, the housing density, and therefore create walkable cities. Uh, and you can see here that some of the houses have got large courtyards and others have got small, so they, you have rich and poor uh, living in the same neighborhood. Uh, you have uh, also, uh, when the courtyard is large, it's transformed into a garden with citrus uh, trees that Give, uh, give fruits that are eatable. And you can also see here uh, the, the possibility of connecting the two houses and the extendability. You can see at the top here, um, a little courtyard house within the big courtyard house that is an apartment for, for when the son in the family or when, when there is a couple, um, one of the children grows up and get married. And then there is this uh, extendability. So there is vertical extendability and there is also horizontal extendability in a way that two houses can be easily adjoined. So you have uh, an urban fabric. Uh, I, I surveyed this in 2004 uh, as part of an HRC project. And it was really interesting because at the time, many of the poor families that have uh, moved to the old city of Fez when the French left uh, Morocco after after the protectorate, many of the wealthy families moved out of these heritage houses, and many of the poor families coming from rural areas for improved living conditions moved and uh, uh, into these houses. And each family would actually live in one room, so you will have multi-family occupation 
as well as a high density of occupation, which of course has played a, a key, an important role in um, the deterioration. So there was a disappropriation of the wealthy families from this heritage in a way that it was associated with backwardness. As wealthy families moved to the French uh, part of the city with, with villas and apartments, as the, this was seen at the time as a social promotion and a sign of progress, whereas the old city, with, with all uh, its qualities in terms of space, environmental uh, and social um, uh, kind of um, cohesion that existed in the past, uh, have been left uh, to become a squatter settlement. Uh, but at the same time, what, it sh what that shows is that this type of houses are very, very versatile in a way that they have accommodated their original families. Then they have accommodated waves of migrants uh, or, or rural migrants that have moved with uh, into these houses. And then uh, they have been gentrified uh, with uh, mass tourism uh, in Morocco, where uh, European uh, diasporas were actually buying these houses and, and, and trans, uh, transforming, transforming them into little hotels or into second residences. So you can see that these houses have adapted and they're still living for many, many centuries. Uh, and they still uh, are uh, versatile for different types of uses. And of course, uh, if we look at the, the harsh climate today, we are talking about zero carbon emission or zero carbon homes, healthy homes, uh, you know, improving well-being, uh, whether physical and, and mental. You know, we can see that these houses actually provided uh, uh, very interesting passive ways of uh, cooling the spaces. So uh, you have fountains for evaporative cooling. But uh, equally, people adapt to the spaces and change their, the way they use the spaces because they are moving from one uh, floor to another. So there is a seasonal uh, mobility within the house and the roof is used also at night for in the summer nights for sleeping. The spaces themselves, the rooms do not have specific functions apart from uh, the kind of large reception area which faces the, the courtyard or the, the fountain. So the other one would be here. And uh, what is interesting is that people move uh, in winter, they live more on the upper floors. In the summer, they live more uh, during the day in the lower floors, and then they will uh, move to the roof, which is accessible. So what is interesting also is that this type of house has been really, uh, um, how can I say, labeled as claustrophobic in a way that uh, people do not have views out, uh, forgetting actually that, uh, uh, that the inhabitants have got access to the roof. And from the, the roof, they have uh, views onto the whole city, particularly when the city is built on a hilly side, um, like Algiers, uh, and you also have views of the city, but the roof space is also a connecting space to other houses where you have possibilities of uh, talking to neighbors, particularly uh, for the women. Uh, and you can see that the text, the, the, um, it's a different conception of uh, space in a way that the facades are inward looking. There is no uh, difference between the houses, apart maybe from the, the, the door, the decorations, um, between a rich house and a poor house. It's only when you get into the houses that you actually realize uh, whether it's a large, small house, and the level of decoration. So the, the role of courtyards in creating microclimates is very important. At that time, you know, there was no need of uh, air conditioning, so you're not using electricity. Um, you have elimination of glare, maximum shading of the surfaces, and so on. Um, and, and you have also this kind of link. I have here a picture of... Uh, uh, we are jumping here to Iran, a picture of uh, wind catchers. So again, those are predecessors of wind, uh, of uh, what do we call it, um, uh, air conditioning unit, uh, where there is a very interesting system of catching the, the cool breezes and bringing them down into the rooms to cool uh, the spaces during the, uh, the hot summer 
days. Um, and then you have also this uh, beautiful uh, combinations of uh, masharabiyas, which help also to create um, a permeable uh, facades where views are possible uh, out, but also there is diminution of glare. This can become very easily sitting spaces where um, potteries are filled with water and help to humidify. We are here in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. And if you know the, uh, the project of Jean Nouvel, the Institute of the Arab World in Paris, uh, he has de developed a, a, mechan a, a, a kind of um, electronic mashrabia where, you, where the uh, aperture or opens, the lenses open and close depending uh, electronically, depending on the uh, level of uh, daylight outside. The, the, the materials that I use are all natural, so the, the, there is a sense, I have interviewed people who live in these houses, and they say compared, particularly Europeans who lived in different types of apartments in Europe, whether they are French or Italians or Spanish or German, and they would say that they, they really feel well living in these houses because there has been gentrification. And of course, the, the production is linked to local know-how and crafts and local materials that are uh, natural. So how do we engage then uh, heritage in economic development without endangering its non-economic values? Values, uh, heritage, what is considered as heritage is all, always linked to a system of values, what we value. Um, and therefore the concept of heritage is quite uh, fluid in a way that, you know, what do you, what is a heritage? At what point a building becomes a heritage? So, you know, you, we know, for example, that the 20th century uh, buildings or the 19th century buildings are also heritage. Is it a matter of age or is it our buildings today are going to be tomorrow heritage. Um, so there are values, unfortunately, uh, uh, today, most of the, there is a lot of demolition of heritage buildings on the assumption that it's, uh, it is cheaper to demolish and build new uh, and, uh, um, and uh, for example, uh, uh, many heritage buildings are left to, to decay. Uh, and the question that uh, the panel will be looking at is, uh, you know, um, is the reuse, adaptive reuse and conservation of uh, heritage buildings uh, zero, uh, is, is a good step towards uh, net uh, zero carbon. Uh, knowing that the, build, the materials that are, of course, uh, in the buildings have got embedded energy. If you are rebuilding, then you are demolishing, you are creating waste, you, you are re uh, using energy to remove the waste, and then you are importing uh, materials from different locations and so on. So the question here is, you know, why is it that many developers do prefer to demolish and build new and uh, also uh, to um, neglect buildings? So the question of heritage comes then in, 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 um, in, at the fore front of, of the discussion, you know, we, we have both the tangible and we have the intangible heritage. We are still here in Morocco and you can see that uh, we, as being in a globalized world, we are uh, in a situation where uh, even the way we eat is also a heritage. So the, the type of uh, uh, food that we eat, uh, if you know that couscous, uh, which is a North African dish, uh, has been added uh, to the UNESCO World Heritage List uh, only two, one last year or two years ago. So the way we eat, which is very uh, transmitted um, from one generation to another, and is based on local goods that are produced lo locally, uh, is, is, very, is also part of our heritage. And it also promotes well-being since the the, the food is based on locally produced. It hasn't traveled, it hasn't got uh, embodied energy through, through uh, long distances. So um, these are some students when I was at Sheffield University who, when we did a, a bit of observation on the um, World Heritage Square of, uh, uh, of uh, Jamal Ifna in Marrakesh. 
and uh, of course we looked at at the food as well. So here you have uh, uh, the tangia marakshia, which is a slow cooking um, stew with vegetables and meat or just vegetables, and then you have the couscous as well. But at the same time, you have uh, you have um, globalization. So here you have the is Istanbul uh, uh, kebab kebab house. Um, and you also have KFC as well. So what is the heritage? Is KFC also now a 21st century heritage or you know, has been around for quite a number of years? So we can see that the question of heritage is, is, uh, uh, is also associated not only with time, but also with the values that are associated. And those depend on who is looking at, at it and why. Uh, and here I thought it would be interesting to uh, show you an example of the type of activities that take place in the World Heritage site of Jam Alif now, which is one of the largest public square uh, in, in uh, Marrakesh. Uh, it has nothing special in terms of architecture, but what is special about it is uh, all the kind of intangible heritage you have uh, you have play, playing music, uh, storytelling, uh, uh, Hanna making, um, uh, food, food uh, selling, uh, and so on. And it has been added to, um, it was one of the projects that triggered the concept of intangible her heritage. But because of, uh, because of uh, low fare um, flights from Europe and el elsewhere to, to Morocco, it's becoming more of a tourist space. And therefore we uh, see gentrification where local population has, has felt the necessity to move out of the old city when uh, new tourists and new uh, expat communities are moving in. And again, here is it something that is sustainable. So sustainability is not only about uh, energy efficiency, uh, sometimes you have to balance between energy efficiency, but also you have to look at cultural and social sustainability. And if you're looking at heritage, at maintaining the link the, between the communities and their heritage, okay, it's a word heritage, but it's now uh, consumed, basically mainly consumed for, uh, for tourism, tourism industry. And with the pandemic, we know how much uh, the cities are suffering because uh, they are not resilient uh, because they are entirely uh, dependent on tourism. And there should be different ways of looking at cities today, even World Heritage cities. So you might say that, oh, well, but we are in the UK, we are interested in projects in the UK. Uh, but yeah, okay, there have been quite a number. If we look at history, there have been quite a large number of projects reinterpreting the quota typology. Uh, and there is a book by about, um, I think it says 6,000 years of housing by Norbert uh, Schoner. And he highlights that only until the 1950s, the courtyard house has gained a wide accept acceptance in the number of European countries like Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, England, Scotland, France, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And um, and of course, the best uh, courtyard, the known courtyard house at the time was the L-shape, L-shape courtyard uh, that has been developed uh, by John Utson, Jorn Utson, who is also the architect of the um, of uh, Sydney Opera House, and it was built in the 1960s for mi mi middle-income families. So, and each house has got 10 by 10 meters oriented uh, for maximum sun gain. So you will see here that. The courtyard is now a sun collector, not a sun protector, because we are in a different climate. Uh, and so you can have here a view where uh, there are quite a bit of similarities with uh, the uh, very blank uh, walls and, and the, the house being looking, looking into its courtyard. And you can see here also the, the same principle that we find in cities, World Heritage Cities in North Africa, Middle East, where you have the um, you know the, the houses around each courtyard, and then you have quite a layering of the spaces from the the, the private to the semi-private to the public space. Um, sorry, 
And, uh, and, uh, and the second uh, project, of course, there are quite a number, and I had the PhD student who actually located all the courtyard housing projects that were done in the 50s, 60s in the UK. This, uh, the one uh, also that is quite known is uh, Bishop uh, Bishopfield in Harlow, which was built by Michael uh, Nalen uh, in 1960. And uh, you can see here that you know the, it allows to have the house completely inward looking. Uh, if we look at the court, uh, I don't know how I'm doing with time. I don't want to, uh, James, how am I doing with time? Yeah, you're doing fine. You've got plenty of time. Don't, oh, okay. No need to rush, right. no need to rush. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, so the, the, the courtyards here uh, create pockets of solar gain. And hey, today we are thinking about solar gain and, uh, and, and harvesting, uh, harvesting solar energy, but also re, uh, re, how can I say, reusing the rainwater or harvesting rainwater. So uh, I forgot to say that in uh, areas where there is enough rain, the courtyards have actually collected the rainwater. And that's the case in Algiers. Uh, and the rainwater goes into a uh, storage in the basement of the house. And that water is used for uh, the washing, for washing clothes. Um, so, so you can see here that some of the concepts that we are putting forward uh, as uh, innovative concepts for uh, a better, uh, uh, for the reduction of our uh, foot carbon footprint have been there and are integrated in many uh, our vernacular architecture um, pro projects around the world, actually. Um, so there is also someone called Peter Land. Uh, as we know, today we have major problem with the uh, housing shortages and affordable housing. Uh, and uh, Peter Land was uh, an architect uh, who has done quite a lot of work for the UN uh, back in the 70s. And he also reinterpreted the courtyard house in the same way as it's a kind of, um, uh, when you, uh, the terraced house, but with courtyards. So you have very kind of long and narrow, um, house form that allows for higher density. And this was created in a project in uh, Peru. In, uh, and we know today you know, that many of the terraced houses are, are also extend, extending with a number of uh, light wells. So you can see that the, the courtyard or light wells are, are an important element for allowing low rise, high density uh, developments to be um, integrated in the in the urban fabric, and someone who also did a lot of research on uh, Leslie Sir Leslie Martin and Lionel March, uh, and we are talking here back in 60s, 70s. They they did a lot of work on trying to see how courtyard house housing perform in terms of uh, environmental performance uh, as well as density performance compared to other forms of uh, urban, urban uh, housing. And they did quite a number of analysis uh, in order to look at how this uh, courtyard uh, configuration could work compared to maybe uh, some blocks or some up. So, so they, 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 this is the reference, but uh, I remember that they found out that uh, you can actually have the same coverage of the land with courtyard housing up with two floors. Uh, as you would do with a seven seven floor height building, so you can imagine that um, allowing direct contact with a, instead of being in flats, you can be in a, a courtyard house with your own little courtyard, uh, and that that will achieve same densities as seven seven floor uh, building blocks. So, are we really reinventing the past? Are we reinventing the wheel? Uh, well, there are many projects which are award-winning to uh, nowadays. So they, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, the architect uh, Peter Barber and uh, has, and I think we had the presenter uh, in the opening of the WSA festival about uh, the how courtyards are used to create dense urban interventions while maintaining access to daylight 
uh, and maintaining access to natural ventilation, which are extremely important to our well-being. We one thing that hasn't changed is that we all need water, we all need fresh air, we all need good food to uh, to survive. And I think with the um, the pandemic, you know, we we realize that only too well. Um, so here you you have density, privacy, natural light and ventilation, solar gain, defensible spaces, adaptability, flexibility, energy efficient, efficiency, all of which existed also in the uh, high density uh, vernacular settlements around the world, which are based on courtyard housing. Another uh, project which is also uh, kind of interesting is the re reinterpretation of the of the terraced house, uh, but then creating uh, this kind of layering of uh, spaces between the private domain and the semi-private and the public domain. And, and so there you, you, you create a more control uh, and ownership of the, of the communal space, which opens uh, a number of possibilities. Okay, um, where am I now? I think that's it. I have finished. Uh, so I just I have done a lot of work also on public paths, uh, historic paths in uh, Islamic uh, cities in North Africa and the Middle East. I'm currently finishing a project which is funded by the AHRC, which is Art Humanities Research Con Council, on retrofitting uh, the um, the vernacular public bath houses in the Medina, the Moroccan uh, historic cities. Um, and this is also a very interesting uh, project in a way that we are, uh, re I have been working for many years, I've been researching the building type for 20 years, but we are trying to uh, first safeguard this building. So the first photo that I showed you right at the beginning, I was mentioning a public path in Cairo. I was documenting all the uh, public paths that were disappearing very quickly. And yet these building types have got many uh, lessons of sustainability in terms of providing a, a communal space, which is not a cafe or a restaurant, or, but it's about washing. But with washing comes the possibility of sharing resources, which is sharing water uh, and uh, being responsible for using uh, water collectively and using uh, the same kind of essential heated water. So instead of the water being heated and distributed to the houses for the district, people would actually walk to the houses, uh, to, the, to the bath. The changing room is also a very important social space. Uh, so the people will know each neighbor, uh, their neighbors in the, in the neighborhood. And all these cities have, within each neighborhood, uh, have got a public bath, whether uh, it's in the in the market area or next to uh, the workshops or every single cluster of houses to a certain extent has got access to a public house, which is almost like the pub in, uh, in British cities where actually people meet, of course, men and women separately because uh, of cultural, um, how can I say, cultural norms of, of uh, not bathing together, um, uh, but uh, there is um, th that institution has survived very much in the North Africa and in Morocco in particular. Uh, and I used to go to the public bath with my grandmother, and I have very fond memories. So a little bit of nostalgia there. <laughs> but uh, what is interesting is that um, you have uh, hot water, uh, you have a furnace. Uh, you have uh, different rooms of different temperatures uh, and you have very good uh, sweating. So you have uh, elimination of toxins. Then you have uh, uh, scrubbing of the skin. So elimination of uh, dead skin. And there is uh, more and more evidence of the uh, health benefits, both physical and mental, for uh, using uh, like what we call today Turkish baths. But in Morocco, uh, of course, Turkish Baths, uh, they are not only Turkish baths, they existed before the Ottoman uh, civilization and which never really reached Morocco. So the Moroccan Turkish bath, uh, the Moroccan baths or public baths are very still the same as the Roman baths. So can you imagine a building type that has still until today continued from the Roman times using underfloor heating system and recycling 
uh, organic um, organic garbage from the neighborhood, you know, recycling byproducts like the olive pits from the olive presses or the wood shavings from the wood workshops as a fuel in the in the in the furnace. So the furnace is a recycling center for the neighborhood. It that, that recycling allows to heat the water, which is shared by people who come to uh, as a, as a social space to to wash and relax uh, and exchange news and and also celebrate major events. So the question here is: uh, there is much more to sustainability than uh, the uh, the carbon footprint. Uh, and uh, of course, carbon footprint is very important today because of the climate change. Uh, we are all experiencing the effects of climate change. But for for the for the for the balance to be established, you have to establish a uh, the intersection between all dimensions of sustainability. That is, environmental, economic, social, and cultural. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for your attention and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions thank you thank you very much magda that was that was really good thank you thank you um if, if i put a message in the chat but if anybody does have any questions please just uh, use the q a function um we have a question i don't know if i press answer live it will um yeah, so the question is um, to do with the first part of your presentation where you were talking about um, uh, the, the courtyard, the courtyard mm -hmm. houses. Um, and the question is, why would uh, why did why did the poor people choose to move into that part of the city uh, as as people left? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the person who asked um, asked and gave the comparison, because where they're from in Syria, those houses are quite expensive and almost the opposite happened where the, the rich stayed in those houses, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in these houses, they were, they were abandoned or most of them have been abandoned because people, as the French left, uh, and that happens in quite a number of countries, not only in Morocco, but in Algeria and Tunisia. Of course, Libya was occupied by the Italians. So, but the French uh, occupied uh, um, the Maghreb countries. So, well, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. So, when the the, uh, Mor the French protectorate in Morocco was finished, uh, many of the people who were living in the European quarters with big avenues uh, and big apartments and villas left. So, they left the spaces, and for for people or Moroccans or wealthy families, for, for them, it was a social promotion to be moving to the more contemporary ha houses uh, or flats or villas. What happened, why the, uh, the, the poor population from rural areas moved into the courtyard houses? Because they were then uh, rented or they squatted. Uh, it was, um, a kind of cheap accommodation. And it happens in many historic centers today where, and you will see, uh, for example, um, all around the world, that's many of these historic uh, cities, they have migrant population or rural migrants who actually uh, move and uh, uh, rent one room to live uh, all together in that room. Uh, and so you, it was uh, the uh, first, the, um, the affordability, of uh, having a, uh, a place to live. And the second, because of the density of the city, the city has got all the markets and has got a number of possibilities for informal employment. So it's also a possibility for informal employment. These people didn't have cars, or so it's also within walking distance to take their kids to schools. Uh, so they, they were, uh, and they, 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 they came with a different type of lifestyle which is linked to their rural, rural uh, uh, economy. Um, so they had to adapt to a new um, way of, of living. They left uh, also the rural areas because of poverty and looking for better uh, living conditions in the city. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, I think that thing that was um, well yeah. said. In, in uh, just as a follow up to sort of my question, in, in a modern context, uh, are these is this typology becoming more and more desirable? 
Yeah. Yes. So, so is is there sort of a switch back where the where the more wealthy part, um, the more wealthy parts of society are moving back into that into that sort of that sort of housing? Well, in North Africa, it's not the case. It depends on the, the scenarios and on how much tourism is open. For example, Algeria is not really open for tourism, so the houses are really deteriorating and. Um, Although the, the old city of the Kasbah in Algiers is a World Heritage Site, uh, there has been uh, a lot of deterioration. In uh, Morocco, um, in Morocco, you have a, a, a phenomenon which started, which is called the Riyadh phenomena. Anyone has been to Morocco and stayed in the Riyadh, which is a kind of courtyard house that has been transformed into a better breakfast. Or uh, and uh, so, if you look at Riyadh, which is R I Y A D, you will see that many, uh, many, particularly in Marrakesh, Isawira, yeah. and also in Fez, houses have been bought by uh, wealthier or or uh, Europeans who retire, for example, French who would retire from France, and they would actually have better living conditions in the warmer climate of North Africa, and for. Or, and they can afford to buy some of the houses and refurbish them. And so uh, many of the families that used to live in these houses were pushed out. Uh, either they were given a bit of money or pushed out to, to go elsewhere. And the houses were uh, then bought by, um, so there was a real estate uh, activity that happened mainly in the 90s and continued until today. Uh, whereby um, Europeans have bought these houses and made them as either their second residences, which means that some of the streets become empty uh, in the old quarters of the city when these people are not there. So that creates another problem of uh, of uh, vandalism and sometimes of crime because those streets are not inhabited for a part of the year or that they are living there and renting. So they are bringing uh, tourists to stay there and they advertise, you could see on the website, they advertise the places like little palaces uh, and they they put court, uh, swimming pools inside the courtyard and they employ local Moroccans to do the cleaning and the, and the, um, and the cooking. And there is a, a sociologist from Mainz University, his name is Peter uh, Escher, Escher Heinz, and he uh, did a lot of kind of surveys and he, call, he called this a, a kind of uh, another neo-colonialism, if you like, uh, of, of these cities. But then the rich Moroccans become interested in doing the same as the Europeans. So some of them are doing that. But when you see what they what uh, people are building when they have the means to, they, they build a large villa with a garden, not a courtyard house. Because Thank it's you. still associated yeah. with backwardness, yeah. I, I think Alexa's just joined us. I have. I can't see myself very well, which is, <clears throat> I'm not overly familiar with Zoom. I'm going to, have to apologise in advance. Uh, no, no, you seem to be going through fine. Um, we, yeah, that's that seems to be the, uh, the last question we've got there. If anybody's got any more questions for Magda, um, please just um, drop them in and we can answer them later on. Um, thank but uh, yeah, thank you very much, Magda. Very good talk. Thanks, James. Thank you. Uh, so, um, yeah, so th this, this year we decided as a, as a cohort, as a sort of organisers for the event that we wanted to really push for actual awards for people who are, who have done particularly good work. Um, and we went through quite a series of um, barriers to get that. Um, but we do have um, Anna, are, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to see you. Um, so we, we each day of this week has had uh, one winner and two runners up. Uh, Anna is our winner for Heritage and History. Um, and she's going to talk us through a little bit of her project. Uh, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, let's see how that goes. Uh, if you if you haven't already, uh, oh God, I hate Zoom. Uh, 
yeah if you if you haven't already i definitely recommend heading onto the website and flicking through a lot of the students work there's some really good work um and you can see if people were nominated through an award through uh, this sort of caption right here um so i'm gonna mute myself and let you take it away anna Okay, yeah, thank you so much for the nomination and the award. It's like super exciting that the work actually got like seen and uh, noticed. Okay, so my project is called the Reliquary for the Forgotten, and it tries to answer a question: Can architecture question our collective memory to retell a forgotten story from the past for the alteration of meanings attached to the existing structures? So the project focuses on the duality of our past, composed of forged memories and the fading truth. It looks at the site of the Westminster Abbey, a 13th century relic of medieval England, glorified by the Gothic revival to a monument to national pride. It also looks at St. Margaret's Church, a 12th century structure hiding in the shadows, collecting what the history wanted to forget. The reliquary changes the existing connections between the two monuments to reintroduce them back to the city of Westminster as living urban artifacts carrying important lessons to current and future society. The reliquary is an addition to St. Margaret's Church that acts as its protective layer to elevate the structure and uncover its forgotten memories. The proposal is also connected to the Westminster Abbey, but not fully. It acknowledges it and protects it, but it's not Abbey's addition. It is only there to tell a full story by combining both histories. The structure celebrates the unknown and creates new meanings for the alteration of our perception of the existing monuments. At the same time, it critiques the current forms of historical preservation that are depriving historical buildings of the natural evolution. The proposal utilizes the idea of transmutation of collective memories associated with different structures. This way, the proposal generates new meanings through the recollection of strategic architectural elements from the past in connections with relics displayed inside. The proposal's main function is to protect the relics, but at the same time tell their story. Therefore, the journey through the building is a journey through British history that has been hidden and altered throughout centuries. This progression is achieved through the change in masonry techniques and the use of vertical planes to create a dialogue between the viewer and the object. The reliquary changes the existing connections between Westminster Abbey and St. Margaret's Church, altering their perceived history and collective memory. St. Margaret gets a new life and is reintroduced to the city as an urban artifact carrying important lessons and messages to current and future society. And Westminster Abbey stops being frozen in time and is reintroduced to Westminster as a structure influencing the change and being in a new dialogue with the forgotten history. So the reliquary is a part of a historical moment, but at the same time, it's a part of the present, influencing our collective memory and how we perceive other urban artifacts within the city of Westminster. It acts as a protective layer to St. Margaret's and the Abbey, treating them as relics and therefore elevating them. Because of its purpose, it has a capacity to change and adapt, grow and accommodate for future needs, therefore becoming a propelling monument. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Does does anybody have any questions for Anna to that her project? Your yeah, questions are already always a tricky one in webinars. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming in. I know it was short notice. Um, no problem. No problem. Thank you once again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, the runners-up for today's prizes couldn't couldn't make it to the seminar. So I'm going to post uh, Anna's and our runners-up um, Claudia and Paulina who are going who couldn't make it today, um, but their projects will be able to be viewed. I'll send you direct links because I know the website sometimes can be difficult to find very specific pieces of work um but thank you so much for coming on and sharing your work um and yes and again sorry for the short notice but congratulations yeah thank you once um, again no problem yeah, that's fine the the awards this year uh, for this for this day were sponsored by kate darby architects um and you'll receive a trophy i believe and uh, and a copy of the yearbook, so you'll be able to see your work printed as well. Yeah, and that's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a small break uh, for ten minutes, um, just so I can get a glass of water, and we'll and I'll post those links in the 
in the chat so everyone can go have a flick through the winners. Um, and I'll I'll be back in at five past seven. And we've got a talk from Alexa Woodward, who's going to talk about um, BIM within conservation. Hi, welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to get that drink. Um, is Alexa there? If I ask her to unmute, maybe. I am. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I can hear you now. Um, okay. There's some weird uh, stuff. Hang on. Uh, but yes, uh, thank you everyone for hanging on over the break. Um, I can see we didn't lose anyone, which is which is pretty impressive. Um, Alexa is an architect at uh, Glancy Nichols, uh, based in Birmingham in England. Um, and you're going to do a talk on BIM in heritage, am I correct? You are. Excellent. Um, well, you should be able to share your screen, so uh, we can we can hop right in, save people listening to me <laughs> okay that's fine we'll see how this goes can you see my screen okay uh we can see your emails at the moment there you go no sorry it's, uh, <laughs> just gonna close that <laughs> okay can you see my screen okay now yeah uh, yeah um i'm just gonna mute and stop my video and let you go ahead Okie dokie. Um, uh, thank you for listening to me talk. Hopefully um, I'm not going to bore you too much um, and I try and keep it interesting. Um, for those, well, most of you don't know me, I think it's probably only Macaulay. Um, I'm an associate director at Glance Nichols Architects and um, I'm a specialist in um, the historic environment. So um, I've worked with listed buildings for um, almost 20 years now. Um, and um, BIM and heritage, um, for want of a better word, is called it HBIM, um, has been something that I've become really interested in in the last three or four years. Um, and I, uh, in 2019, also wrote a heritage BIM um, research paper with the University of Wolverhampton. Um, so hopefully I'm going to give you a bit of a background in terms of, um, I don't know how much some of you may or may not know. Um, in terms of how we work on listed buildings and the value that BIM can bring. Um, so typically when um, we are asked to work on a listed building, we often um, start um, with the listing um, that's held by Historic England. Um, and this is one um, that was done for Garth House, which is part of the University of Birmingham. And um, typically the, the listings, the majority of them were done in around the 80s when there was a bit of a drive. Um, some have been updated since then. Um, but this listing theoretically outlines why a building is of heritage significance, but they can range um, from two lines to three or four pages, depending on how detailed um, the assessor was when they visited it. But this is always our first port of call, which in theory, is telling us um, wh why the building is listed um, to a point. Um, one of the other areas that we tend to look at is um, the map cartography. So we will start to go through the historical maps and look how the building is, has evolved um, and progressed through time to give us a little bit of an understanding about how the uses have changed, how ownership might have changed, um, outbuildings, annexes, and we use things like tithe maps and things like that. Um, if we're really lucky, we might be able to find some existing drawings, um, but that does depend um, on the age of the building um, and how good people were at record keeping. Um, and it's not always great. Sometimes you get next to nothing and other times you might get a treasure trove. It really does depend and you, you don't really know what you're going to get. Um, so Garth House is an example. The plan that I gave here was from um, a book called Das English House, um, which we managed to find a plan from. Um, you don't get a key with it. You just get a little bit of a layout and some historical photos. Um, and then we typically, um, these are examples of some sections that the client had in their possession. Um, 
but there were sections that were done for proposed work. So you've kind of got to start to try and interpret what may have been done and how much of it was was implemented. Um, quite often, um, they're not always in the best condition. Um, and we have to take the listing as well and go around the building and have a bit of a look as to what kind of key features, senses of craftsmanship, functionality in the layout that we think may be important um, as part of that building. And we will look at things like the timber panelling, um, even kind of the ironmongery um, and the emblems and symbolism in, in, in the ironmongery or any of the glasswork and things like that and why they're significant. Um, now, um, when we look at conservation projects, um, every decision that we make um, is based around um, a, a skeletal ethic and philosophy, um, which is born out of three main documents, which is the Athens Charter, the Borough Charter, um, and the English Heritage Conservation Principles. And the very definition of conservation, which I always put up there, I really like it, it's one of my favourite, is it's the process of ma managing change to a significant place, but one that will sustain its heritage values by actually reinforcing or revealing those values for future generations. Now, we assess um, significance by looking at those heritage values, which are evidential value, which is the potential of a place to, to yield evidence about past human activity. Historical value, which is the way in which people and events or aspects of life are connected through a place. Um, Aesthetic value, which is how we draw sensory and intellectual stimulation from it. And that could be kind of anything from how a detail is executed from a craftsmanship point of view through to how it makes people feel. Um, and then also communal value. So what meaning that place holds for people and how they relate to it um, and how it might be related to, to certain um, points in their memory or, or specific events. Um, and what we do is we go through all the historical information and we make an assessment based on those four values as to what the heritage value is that sits within those four categories. Um, and then from that, we attribute, I, I guess, a, a level of significance from those heritage values. So generally, we say it's high, high medium, low, and then we try and transpose that onto the features um, and the key aspects of the fabric. So we start to gain an understanding of which bits of the building are, have a higher significance than others and as a display of those heritage values. And that very much informs our decisions as to how we alter or how we repair or how we refurbish those buildings. But it fundamentally um, forms the backbone of, of all our decisions. In addition to that, we obviously do a condition survey, um, and as I alluded to earlier, they're not always in the best condition. Um, and if it's gone through um, multiple um, changes and modifications, or not always what you see um, is exactly as it is, and they have a tendency to hide a multitude of sins. So from that, we'll do our own levels of recording and investigations. Um, as a couple of images that I've got there to kind of show you. Um, and that would range um, from micro drilling and using an aboroscope to, to get into voids, to doing ultrasound and moisture surveys, um, and also thermographic surveys to understand where we may or may not be losing heat. Um, we sometimes do reconstructions to look at where a certain feature might have been. Um, and try and understand from a building pathology point of view as well how the building is now working because traditionally historic buildings everything was built in line um, and it was designed as a as a breathable fabric and now we very much um, design um, kind of closed non-air permeable environments but an energy efficiency point of view but there's very much a conflict between the two and a lot of the work that we do tends to be putting right where people have, in effect, tried to close the box and they've used impermeable materials, um, which can cause significant damage um, to old traditional breathable materials. 
So where that in effect gets us to is we get to a point where we just have this huge volume of information to manage, to try and understand and make informed decisions um, about a building. And actually, this is where BIM um, really comes into its own. So what I'm going to do is kind of take you through a couple of case studies um, and show you how we used BIM. And um, it has been a bit of a learning curve because I think when you, you think about BIM in its in its raw sense of new buildings, it's the value that it brings to coordination of components and design and that level of detail. Um, and, and HBIM absolutely has that capacity to do that, but actually it has so much more um, value than that. Um, and when we did Garth House, as I showed you before, we had really limited information um, and we were struggling to try and understand how all these pieces of the building and how it evolved related together. So we made a decision to build our own BIM model and we started to phase what we knew was historical from the historical plan. And then we started to look at the areas that we weren't sure about. And what that allowed us to do was to, to see the gaps in our information and really reveal where we then needed to go in um, and find out a little bit more. So we, in effect, rebuilt the historical plan and then overlaid it over our new plan. Um, and we could really start to understand how the function of the building had evolved um, into its new layout. And it actually re really allowed us to understand how the hierarchy of the building as in effect a, a, a former almost manor type house worked with what would have been the front of house and the coach house and the service quarters and things like that. Um, we also then kind of fed in, I guess, the map history um, for Garth House to understand how the Curtilage buildings had evolved and how they come in and how they may connect into each other. And actually, much later, we used that information in the BIM model to coordinate where we thought all the historical paths may have been. And when we went back and did um, a low-level dig, we actually found those as well, which was really interesting. Why am I going? Ah, there we go. I'm going backwards. Am I going backwards or forwards? I can't work it out. Sorry. Bear with me. Sorry. Told you I wasn't very good on Zoom. Um, so Garth House also had um, a plethora of things wrong with it. Um, it had been um, uninhabited for a really long time. Um, it had issues with the roof slipping. Um, it had massive leaks. Um, it had what everyone's favourite thing is an ivy because everyone always thinks it looks pretty as it's destroying your building underneath. Um, it wasn't shelling water particularly well. Um, but it had inside some really quite beautiful features. And actually, the more we began to understand about the building, um, the more we understood the importance of these and how they'd taken that role um, in it as a kind of house of house of standing. Um, so what we did is we started to layer over that information that we'd learned in the BIM model. It really allowed us to isolate where we needed to go and investigate, where we didn't feel we could make decisions one way or another as to whether we could modify something or how we should repair something because we weren't clear on that particular age of building. Um, it also allowed us then to plot on from our building surveys where we had areas of defects or patterns of moisture. We were able to plot that into the model. And actually what that allowed us to visually see is to see what the common factors were to give us a really good idea as to where we needed to go in and open up and learn more about the building. So we were very much using it from a informative point of view to understand the history of the building, to inform our decisions on how we may make the modifications, but also to allow us to understand how the structure was functioning in, in a slightly different way. And actually, it was really interesting because what we found out is actually we had a, a horrible issue with damp and rainwater but it actually wasn't coming from where we thought it was and actually just simply plotting um, the patination of damp actually allowed us to isolate it a, a hell of a lot quicker and, and actually stopped further damage to the building and actually by isolating and highlighting the areas of structural cracking we were able to open up in a really good area and actually what that allowed us to see was in the 60s, they'd inserted a steel um, into a concealed cavity um, that wasn't protected. 
and it was corroding and that was pushing the whole top of the building out. But, but had we not plotted that patination, we wouldn't have known exactly where to look. We would have had to kind of just roll with it um, and see what happened. So it really kind of gave us value from that point of view. Um, so we use that information to kind of plot onto our drawings and tender drawings. Um, this is um, just some images of the building as we were in construction, um, just to give you an idea, I guess, of the complexities that we were dealing with um, and the condition of the building. Um, and this image that you see in the bottom right hand corner here is the steel that was corroding that we that we opened up um, because they always look worse before they get better. Um, and actually also in understanding more about the building and the roles of each of the individual spaces, we were able to understand which were the areas of higher significance. And we were able to have that air of caution and it gave us that time to go in and investigate. And we found some really good finds in there as well. So we found an original safe um, and some original parquet floor that was beyond its life, but we retained in situ. Um, and we also uncovered an original horse trough sink that wasn't visible um, in the coach house as well, um, which was really nice. Um, and anyone that kind of knows anything about lists of buildings is we're always really careful um, what we do to them and the amount of drawings and level of detail um, that we have to do for them is, is huge and is a significant amount. And it really has that capacity in it to give you that efficiency and drawn information as well for things like ream elevations. And it really allows you to see the impact of what you're doing in a 3D form that is much easier to understand. Um, so I just always put some photos of the finished building, which hopefully you think looks infinitely better than the first. Um, and this was a arts and crafts building, grade two star um, by architect William Bidlake, who was typically an ecclesiastical architect. Um, and he only actually designed five houses, of which Garth House was one. And there was only two in Birmingham and the other one got arson attacked. Um, so a really significant building. And actually that consideration and time and that value that Bin gave us really enabled us to make the right decisions. And um, there's re there is just it just helped the process so significantly. I can't explain that. So these are the interiors which are reinstated. Um, however, there's a little bit more value in the Bin than that as we got into it. So typically, when we hand back um, a listed building, we are never ever in a position because of what they are to have done everything that you ever want to do to it and they often come with what we would say managed defects so there are it's just part and parcel of the age of building and type of construction that they are handed back with significant maintenance requirements so we we ordinarily structure um, what's called a conservation management plan or maintenance plan um, that's operated on a traffic light type system um, and that would go back and highlight what maintenance needed doing um, within set periods. So anything with a red traffic light is one, one year, amber is two to four, and then green is kind of within the next five years. So you ordinarily try and obviously hand them back without anything that one's doing immediately. And we started to see the value that might be in utilising the BIM model um, for managing that data because quite often when we hand buildings back the handover information goes into someone's bottom drawer and then no one ever sees it again until something goes wrong um, so we started to think about how how we could change that and how we could start to link together um, the conservation plan um, and the BIM model so then that brings me on to my second case study, um, which has recently been completed. And I did toy with the idea of um, showing you some completion photos, but um, I, I thought I'd better not just in case I get in trouble um, from the client. So um, I will send some round um, when I'm told I can release them just to give you a bit of an idea. Um, now, this one was a former bank. Um, it was built in 1931 by famous Midland architect Cecil Howitt, um, and it was the headquarters um, of the Birmingham Municipal Bank. Um, and we were commissioned by the University of Birmingham to turn it into, in effect, a learning conference in hub. Um, 
And despite its age and really extended period of dereliction, which is kind of pushing 14 years, had some really beautiful features in it. Um, it still had a bank vault, complete with loads of vault boxes, which you can see in the top right. Um, the top left is the main banking hall um, and uh, a beautiful committee room that was timber panelled and um, a lot of really beautiful neoclassical features, which were really linked into its significance because when the bank was built, it was all about giving that sense of security um, to make people want to invest their money in the bank, which was originally built to, to fund um, the war effort. Anyone that's seen Line of Duty um, will recognise two of the pictures on the left because that's where the station was um, in Series 1, if anyone recognises it. Um, and actually, even for a bank, um, and it was it was grade two, you know, two list, grade two listed, um, had some really rare features about it. So in the bank vaults, it had um, over ten thousand safes. Um, in the main banking hall, there was a really rare dual sided timber clock. Um, the timber panel in it was contained in a number of rooms was also really rare because it was a cone of walnut, and the level of detail that was executed is really unusual. Um, for 20th century buildings but actually also it pushed technology even at, even at its age in the turn of the 20th century they were using um combined masonry and steel frame they were using what in effect was a very early cement um and even the windows were huge large span windows um that actually used copper came in for fireproofing so on the face of it it was there was a hell of a lot more to it um, than it looked like um, and you can also see the the repetition of the emblem, emblem, emblems from the neoclassical style so you see the use of the rosette um, the egg and dart um, the bead and reel and the acanthus leaf and that runs through absolutely everything in the building and in, in a really beautiful way um, but it was in a bad condition, um, as you can see from the from from some of those images. Um, and we were lucky in this instance because um, actually because it was such a significant building in Birmingham, because um, it sits on one of the main squares and was linked into, um, in effect, an early 20th century master plan that was only ever partially executed because of World War II. Um, there was an awful an awful lot of archive information. So we had all the original plans, we had the original architect specification, um, and we had um, all the original um, historical images. And um, we made a decision um, alongside the clients um, at a reasonable cost um, to have a scan to BIM. Um, so we, because it was such a large building, um, we went in and they scanned it and built us um, a, a BIM model of the whole building so that we knew that our work was starting from really good um, baseline data. Um, and that kind of pretty much formed um, the basis of our model and our architectural proposals. And I think, um, as I said before, it, it informed our decisions and how we understood the layout, albeit we had a lot more information than we'd had previously, um, but it really allowed us to visually experiment and see the impact of things on the interior spaces, like in the banking hall um, with the changes of roof light and things like that. So it was a really useful um, architectural tool. So these are some of the visuals that we produced, and this was all done um, alongside the BIM model. And actually what we were doing as part of our work is knocking off part of the lower quality brick um, part of the building and it was then replaced with um, almost like a double fronted stone frontage um, as part of that um, but what it came with um, was a huge myriad of problems and um, we had excessive water leakage um, which had completely destroyed a lot of the coffers in the banking hall um, and had had a substantial impact um, on a lot of the lime plaster ceilings, fibrous plaster ceilings um, and the limestone. Um, and we also had water penetration into the stoneworks. We had a lot of structural cracking. Um, we had asbestos um, combined with a lot of bronze work. Um, and actually in its evolution, it lacked any real fire compartmentation either. Um, 
so there was a lot of investigation work that we needed to do about the building. The top picture is my favourite picture. Um, that is Pip, um, and she is a rot hound. Um, so she works as one of the building pathologists that we work with a lot, and she is trained to sniff out dry rot, which we love because it means we don't have to knock holes in um, in, in buildings to find out if we've got a, a, a timber rot problem. But um, she is a, a large source of fun for us when she comes on site in her little PPE. Um, so we also um, took out some of the windows to do some investigation on how they went together and how we could repair them. Uh, we did some trials on the stonework. Um, we did detailed surveys of the coffers. And the one in the bottom left is also um, where we did some paint analysis testing to understand um, how the historical paint finishes um, built up as well. Um, and due to the amount of water that came in, um, we had to do a, um, a thorough examination of humidity and moisture levels as well to understand how they would impact the building, but also how it was likely to impact the building as the building began to become occupied and dry out. Because actually it's really important that you manage that humidity and level of moisture control, because in conservation, it's the fluctuations in temperature that do the damage. Um, and we also had to do a lot of thermographic work to understand how damp the structure was and understand the impact of drying out. So we were removing stonework and drying out areas at very low temperatures and seeing how the building reacted to try and control that just to stop movement. Um, and we also did a lot of boroscope analysis uh, where we had bolted ceilings, one for checking for asbestos and two to understand how they were supported and how they were likely to be impacted um, by the moisture. Um, and all that information got fed back into our BIM model. Um, it allowed us to be really sensible um, about demolition and managing change and making sure that we were doing takedowns in the right way. It allowed us to, to go in and be sensitive in that exploration um, and really make informed decisions and actually feeding that directly into a 3D environment enabled us to see patterns in support and structures um, and, and really gave us a, a, a much better insight um, into how that construction worked. Um, and also, we don't often, when we do things like paint analysis and things like that, we're not easily able um, to always see the patterns in how different areas have been built up and changed. So again, feeding that in um, made a really big difference. Um, and as part of that, we spent an awful lot of time on the scaffold doing the surveys of the existing building, um, where repointing wanted to do and where repairs were needed, uh, where we needed to clean. Um, and again, all that level of information was fed back into um, that, that 3D environment. Um, and what it enables us to do when we do the re really detailed scope of works drawings, um, your reliance isn't there on 2D information. You can see it in a 3D environment and you know that you're working on good and current information. You're not having to ferret around for plans or reports. So the value of having everything in one common data environment when you're dealing with so much information is huge. Um, and the other side of it is one of the single biggest issues that you often have um, with a listed building is they are often designed for much bigger numbers or a completely different use to what you would normally have. Um, and so quite often the fire and services impact on a building is significant. And this is where it also has the ability in a similar way to what new build does. Um, is when you feed in that survey information and where you've done investigations and you know that these really important factors and structures and moisture is, you can then take that services model and feed it into the building and really start to track and make those really informed decisions about the best routes and start to move that around the building and to very much reinforce that area of reversibility and know with confidence that you are making the best decisions about those new interventions, whether it's a ceiling or it's the services, and you can really understand the impact on the historic finishes. Um, this one was also particularly tricky um, because we were taking an existing building capacity of kind of circa 200 um, and pushing it up to circa 900. 
um, which was huge. So managing the ventilation, but also managing the plant requirements. So then having that BIM model and being able to see how those things pass up through the building and make really key decisions about where we needed to thread services and put risers, but also from a visibility point of view so that we could ensure at ground floor level from those really key vistas across the city that all that plant was completely hidden. Um, and I, this has been a complete piece of magic and I almost didn't believe it when I saw it, when it actually got done. But despite the sheer volume of stuff on the roof and the amount of services that have been thread into the building, there's absolutely no visibility of that in the building at all, which was an absolute real triumph. Um, which kind of brings me on to my kind of closing slide. Um, so from what we learned on Garth House and understanding that we have all this information and it's really valuable and it gives you not only a history of the building and the relevance of the significance, but also it forms a really important basis of that conservation plan that we're handing back um, because it's really important as a client or an end user that you understand the significance of your building and which areas are of higher significance, but also where those elements of maintenance are or something that specialists such as, the like, for example, on the coffers, we went in and repaired it, but there is consistent monitoring that will be needed to be done for a period of three to five years to make sure that it doesn't move um, as the building settles down. Um, so what we've done um, is almost developed uh, a traffic light system that links into the central model that is handed back to the client that is very much it is the conservation plan but it's in a live environment so we have a rook that you can see in the bottom corner there um, and that is very much then added to each room that we deem to be of high significance so it tells you why the room is of significance and acts as a totem and a marker to say you shouldn't be doing anything in this in this area um, without further advice um, and then all the sticky discs that you see around have been added to the higher significance features um, and they move on a time period based on when maintenance needs doing and highlight what maintenance needs doing but also list the conservators that have been or would ideally be involved um, in the kind of continuous repair of that um, and it's very much linked into the work that I did on the research paper that I wrote with David Heath from at Wolverhampton um, in getting people to understand that actually this heritage and the heritage that we have is one of our biggest assets. And the most important part of that is ensuring it's there and it's sustainable for future generations. And to do that, people need to understand it. They need to be able to relate to it, but they also need to understand how these buildings are different, how they breathe, how they're traditional and what's special about it. Um, so it was very much about taking all that information that's embedded in those reports and getting it into a common data environment that is easily accessible, easily understandable, so that works to a list of building then don't become reactive. They don't become repair um, because of really bad condition. They become planned maintenance. And by being able to make that cultural shift, that's in essence what makes our our building sustainable um, for long term. And that's where BIM has this amazing potential um, really to educate people more so um, than it just being about geometry and coordination. So I am going to stop talking now because I've talked by far enough. I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Quite possibly. Um, it, yeah, no, that was that was really good. Seeing the drawings on three CS again um, just sort of brought back memories flooding from the stage three and stage four reports we did back. Ages yeah. Ago. So for, for anyone that didn't know, um, Macaulay worked on three centenary square for eighteen months. Macaulay. Yeah, something about that. It was it was early stages when we got it in from Make. Yes. But yeah, it was a. So it was almost so they all came flooding back when you start seeing those really complicated drawings with all of the, all of the pointing, um, the pointing maintenance and everything. It was it all just came flooding back. 
Uh, I am going to post a link to uh, the university's page on the building because they've published they've published a few photos, a yeah. few bits, yeah. So um, for anybody who is interested, because I did go and visit um, uh, a few weeks ago, actually, and yeah, it was sort of incredible just to start see drawings come come to life in front of you. It's it's soft. It's on soft opening now, so you can actually go and have a coffee in the banking hall. <laughs> Yeah, we we did we did go in. It just I think they were just finishing off when we went in, so they were a bit leave <laughs> sort, sort of attitude to it. But it was it was, it was really good. Um, for for anybody who does have any questions, um, yeah, just use the Q and A um, portion at the bottom, and then um, we should get any of those through. Um, but yeah, so it was really interesting, and BIM has come such a long way over the past sort of five. Even since I graduated from my undergraduate, BIM has come leaps and bounds every year when they release more and more. And it's, yeah, it's, it, and actually, in I think in the last 12 months, um, it, it is more visibly being used in the heritage sector as well. And there's some really, um, for anyone that finds it interesting and just wants some bedtime reading, um, I would recommend like the way that they're using BIM to look at the reconstruction of Notre Dame from laser scans that they had and assessing the impact of the fire is just, it's absolutely, it's, it's, it is phenomenal and <laughs> it just blows my mind. Um, but certainly in the last 12 months, the way that people are using it, in particularly in heritage, has really gone through the reef, which is really, really, really good to see because if it does nothing, then get it out there and I think COVID helped with that as well um that the idea that it it becomes a lot more web-based for people to be able to relate to it as well is really positive yeah. and then it, and it's such a it's such a good tool in in sort of stamping that point in history for the building as sort of giving records to future generations for for when it is a when it is a it becomes an even more historic building when the next generation of people need to refurbish or rework its use yeah you, you've got that in, in, incredibly detailed history which is going to be so useful for the people in 100 200 years but yeah they won't have to go through the same pain that we went through yeah have it there. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll do presentations just saying yeah we don't have to do this anymore <laughs> yeah we know we know what it's all about <laughs> that's really good Th thank you so much for coming in um You're on welcome. the talk thank you so much yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I believe uh, with Paulina, who was a runner up for the award ceremony earlier, is uh, hi, Paulina. Hi. Um, uh, he's gonna talk us through her project a little bit. Um, I will be um, very yeah. quick. <laughs> Let me just share my screen, give me a second. Uh, so you, I'm so used to Teams, I don't use Zoom anymore. Uh, that one, yes. Okay. Yeah, you just want to, uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll mute myself and get rid of me. Um. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you. So sorry for popping up so late. Um, I promise not to be too long. Um, so my project was called um, A School of Campanology. Um, similar to Anna, I was also in um, Unit 20, which is Designing Histories. Um, and our site was in the city of Westminster. So um, the city of Westminster was built around Westminster Abbey. So first came the Abbey, then the Palace of Westminster, as Edward the Confessor decided to move all the wealth and the power away from the city of London. However, finding that the population was growing around the Abbey, um, and was continually increased further by crowds of people who, for good, but mostly bad reasons, sought the shelter of the sanctuary. He raised a new church and had dedicated it to St. Margaret's. Um, so my intervention at St. Margaret's looks at creating a sentient monument which merges the themes of sanctuary and campanology from a notion of ritual and its ability to activate and reactivate meaning and memory. It provides sanctuary to a society of change ringers at St. Margaret's Church in Westminster, who have occupied the space in the early 1890s. Um, to me, a ringing bell ho holds a key to memories, 
So not just your own past, but everyone else's. We associate bells with providing us with a structure to our lives. Um, they ring in time, in peace, in death and in memory. Um, the idea that they help us remember or we remember an event brings forward a thought. Uh, can the sound of a ringing bell be an unintentional monument? And if so, can a building designed to ring and be heard be a sentient monument? So having identified the three key spaces within the ideal bell tower, the intervention looks at mirroring and rearranging the, their principles to form new, four new practice bell towers that have the learning experience of both the teacher and the student in mind. Um, and yeah, that is basically my project. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I do apologise. I uh, I must have not sent the link properly, which is why oh, you no, had issues joining. But <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I'll stop sharing that. Yeah. Um, oh, I think it's a question. Um, yeah. How did you select this project? Um, so I started off my research with looking at how Westminster grew along with these different parishes. And the first parish that was established was the parish of St Margaret's um, and to me it was very curious how close the church was to Westminster Abbey as a whole it's about I don't think it's any further than five meters away from it and um, it was just this idea that you know it's in the shadows of an abbey why is it there um, so I started um, researching more into the sanctuary laws and what happened and basically um, the monks that occupied um, Westminster Abbey didn't like the fact that quite a few felons and well poorer people um, were entering the abbey because it was meant to be for both them and obviously the king um, for um, special events and occasions and back then the sanctuary laws were um, quite a big thing so you know you could walk into the church ask for sanctuary and you were basically given help and the government well I don't probably didn't have the government but no one could do anything for you to you um so this is why St Margaret's was built was it was for the poorer people um for people that you know needed the sanctuary or needed the extra help and um it was this idea to me that you know there's a massive amazing abbey right next door but people actually use St Margaret's more because it was more it was a church for the people rather than mo the monarchy so that stood out to me the most um and yeah thank you does anybody else have any questions No, I think that I think that's everyone. Thank you so much, Paulina, for coming on. Again, mm -hmm. apologies about the link. Uh, I know it's but fine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so finally, uh, to wrap up the, this evening's to wrap up this evening's events, um, Bayan, who is a, a PhD student uh, under Magda's supervision. Um, is going to talk us a bit through her research project. Um, is Bayan there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Excellent. Um, yeah, so if you if you want to share your screen and we'll we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, it's all come up. Okay, so first of all, thank you for inviting me and for the WSA for this exhibition. Um, my name is Bayan Fauri, and he, as he said, uh, my main supervisor is Dr. Magda Shipley, presented earlier this evening. And my research is about heritage-led urban regeneration in the context of UNESCO World Heritage nomination. I have also a critical sustainable alternatives for the city of Assault in Jordan. 
So basically, my uh, my research has uh, three main aspects. Uh, first, there's the uh, World Heritage Listing and the Urban Regeneration Schemes within the MENA region specifically. And then there's the corpus of the UN Initiatives for Sustainable Development. And we have also the timely case study of assault, um, the recently inscribed the city of assault in uh, July 2021. So uh, I will start by looking at the uh, the UNESCO World Heritage uh, Map uh, for you know, for inscribed properties, and by highlighting the MENA region in red, uh, we notice that uh, it housed uh, 132 World Heritage sites uh, among 1,121, and it's uh, looking at the size of the MENA region and how the the uh, distribution of World Heritage sites along. We ask ourselves. Like, um, oh, what is a World Heritage Site? What's the outstanding universal value? Who and how it's evaluated? We have to know that once a city is on the World Heritage List, it expects benefits uh, such as uh, financial and techni technical um, uh, help. And there's a lot of... Um, pride and logistic uh, issues with that. But we also have, uh, in the same time, some people might find it problematic, such as um, giving out power for others to be, other stakeholders to be involved in the decision-making process. Uh, but mainly my main issue that I'm tackling in this research is dramatically increase in the number of tourists in a World Heritage Site being in UNESCO World Heritage Listing as a catalyst for uh, urban regeneration projects and um, in, by that, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of uh, World Heritage Sites around the MENA region and looking and tracing how uh, this uh, heritage and urban regeneration pattern um, and how there's uh, been uh, some neglection of the connection between tangible and intangible issues. And uh, I'm looking at the focusing on um, one static value and neglecting other values that are important to other stakeholders and uh, therefore creating urban regeneration issues such as uh, forced eviction and demolishing, uh, the nomination as a catalyst for the uh, urban development, gentrification and pushing people away from their houses, uh, consuming and commercializing heritage to, for being uh, luxurious and uh, for this nostalgic feeling of the city, uh, selective heritage discourse by you know selecting which values are most important than others, and uh, this contradicting discourse of what are values that are more, more important than others and displacing displacement and losing connection between tangible and intangible issues. And this is currently such such regeneration pattern. We already see uh, many uh, aspects to that. In the recently inscribed city of Assal, uh, I've been tracing the city several um, by its uh, more than one one trial of nominating the city on the World Heritage List. And with each trial, the same pattern of regeneration keeps coming, and uh, with many urban development. In projects that are tourism led, that are um, that are luxurious led, uh, to make the city more presentable, make the city more uh, beautiful, uh, in, in in a sense, and um, all the all the buildings that do not fit in that category are demolished, and people are moving out of these buildings and from mostly outside of the city boundary. These buildings are uh, among institutional buildings, schools, and uh, mixed use buildings that are. Are, um, not related to the golden era of the city, while it the the in, um, um, the one that is associated with the outstanding universal value. So uh, because of that, I looked at the corpus of the UN initiatives for sustainable development, and mainly the uh, the most recent ones, those are the uh, historical urban landscape and the uh, 2030, the timely 2030 agenda for sustainable development and the new urban uh, agenda. And um, but um, one of the most important ones and the one that is the umbrella of all others, the, the one that is timely uh, in this time time is the uh, Change Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And uh, one of the main targets of that is 11.4, the Protect Our uh, the World's Cultural and Natural Heritage. 
Uh, now, while it's the main one, there's also many related uh, aspects such as uh, target, um, um, there's target 9 and target um, uh, 11 and then uh, 17. Um, but because of issues that we I found during uh, investigating uh, sustainable development goals, uh, such as the um, social and cultural sustainability were a little bit under tap than eco economical and environmental sustainability. And this is visible by looking at the targets and the indicators of the targets. Like for example, 11.4, protect our world cultural heritage is measured by the uh, amount of expenditure that is spent on the world heritage city, on on um, on, on our heritage, tangible and tangible heritage, and not the our level of awareness or no or the uh, community engagement, nor um, how are we are we spending this money? So um, because of that, I've decided to incorporate uh, aspects from other UN initiatives, such as the historical urban landscape approach, and then the new urban agenda to complement areas in the target uh, um, in. Uh, goal 8, 11, and 17, and the specifics target to that to um, probably get an integrated approach to uh, uh, to create a set of uh, recommendations, uh, a set of what-if scenarios uh, for a sustainable alternatives that can be um, that can be incorporated for any city that is on the World Heritage List or in or pursuing that inscription. And for my methodology, the case of assault is the timely case study that I'm going to do two rounds of field work. One is already done before the inscription uh, on the World Heritage List and one after the inscription. And with comparing different stakeholders' opinions, but also same stakeholders, but within different times, uh, we'll get an understanding of how these values are negotiated and then with the sustainable development goals and the other UN initiatives we can um, we can create some syntheses and uh, the, and these recommendations uh, that might help in any city that's going through the inscription process so that's it I've decided to make a very uh, short presentation I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bayan. That was really good. Um, did, do we have any questions either in the chat or in the Q and A? Yeah, like I said earlier, questions are a, a tricky thing in webinars. <laughs> you really have to poke them out of your audience. Um, that's going to wrap up today's event uh, we did have other things planned but um we we had a few um we had a few dropouts due to unforeseen circumstances so um we we did have a panel planned but um it, it, it's it's difficult without those people so i do apologize for that um but i think i think we've we've had a lot of talks had a lot of people on i think it's it's been a good evening um uh, yeah, I'd like to thank yeah all all of my all of my co-hosts and panel members for coming on, especially with some talks being very last minute. Um, but yeah, th thank you, thank you everyone for coming on. Um, and hopefully we get to do this again at some point. I know the the school are eager to do more events like this one, and I think it'll be good to good to have people on again. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you, you James. Thank you very much, James. Uh, it's been great to be part of this event. Uh, thank you so much for organizing it, and and thank you to all the speakers. It's been amazing. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, um, we're gonna we'll we'll post links to everybody's socials and all the students' work who have participated in today. All the winners of the awards. Uh, I think I've already posted them, but. Yeah, keep an eye out for our socials and yeah. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'll, I'll see you later. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Take you. care. Bye-bye.